Thank you. Okay, so your job is to make sure I don't go beyond the mark here because I go off camera then, okay? So I'd like, I'd like to thank John for having me back again. There was actually a talk on Civil War subs in there also, Alligator. Uh, this is my fifth book, third one that's appropriate to discuss here. And to start off, I want to apologize for the stunning visuals you won't be seeing. The gods of technology wiped out a week's worth of work last night. Uh, the entire drive fried, so even my, my artwork, I couldn't stay up till midnight and recreate it. But uh, happily, I will not be holding the book up and walking around. We'll diagram what needs to be diagrammed, and hopefully it's all up here. The story you're about to hear begins with an ending, namely the end of the Crimean War. And just to put it in context, this takes place in the mid-1850s. While it is as familiar in England and France as our Civil War is to us, most Americans don't know that much about the Crimean War. Part of it is fought in the Baltics. Most of it is fought down in the Black Sea. Uh, ostensibly, it starts because the Turks are denying the Russians access to religious sites. That's a trumped up charge. It's just part of the great game. The Russians are trying to push their way south as they always have and gain access uh, to, to wider vistas, if you will. The war takes place, the biggest battle, of course, is the siege of Sevastopol. It is a year-long battle. It's not really a siege because the Russians can always leave if they want to. It is actually an accidental siege. The Russians have been beaten in the southern part of the Crimean Peninsula and retreated north through Sevastopol, ready to get off the Crimean Peninsula and defend the Isthmus. Then the French and British and Turks, the Allies as we'll call them, decide to stop and entrench. And the Russians, oh, I guess they're gonna think we're gonna defend the city. So they rush back and defend Sevastopol. It is a 355 day battle. 230 men are killed in the space of those 12 months. When the Russians finally leave after a key fort falls, what has still been left standing by the bombardment, and there are millions and millions of shells lying everywhere, uh, is burned by them. The town is totally wiped out. Of 15,000 homes, 60 are inhabitable. Of a 70,000 population before the war, 6,000 are left. There are only two industries left in town, picking up the bones of dead cavalry horses to sell them back to the British for a fertilizer, and picking up our, uh, iron often from exploded shells, sometimes from unexploded shells. Usually once every five or six days someone is killed by an exploding shell. There are places you cannot walk in the town of Sevastopol because it is literally carpeted with shells. On the harbor of Sevastopol, whoops, that probably won't be the last time I do that. The harbor of Sevastopol, and this is why it was such a key feature, is about four miles long. The Chenea River comes in here. It is defended by hordes of forts and is a major, major base for the Russian Navy, the Black Sea Fleet. It's four miles long, a mile across, and fairly <laughs> shallow. It's only 60 feet at its very deepest. Uh, it is home to the, uh, not just the headquarters, but also in this section here, the Karabelnaya dry docks. There are six slips in these dry docks, three times as many as in the Brooklyn Navy Yard in this period. It is ultra modern. The Russians have spent hordes of money on this port. It is a military base. It is not a civilian town. This is why the British want to wipe it off the face of the map. If they can wipe this out and forbid the Russians from rebuilding, basically the Russians will have no viable defensive port or offensive port to go against the Turks in the Black Sea. The Russians decide that their Achilles heel is not the Allied armies out this way, but the threat of the Allied fleet coming in with their heavy guns and reaching the town and the back of the lines. The forts here they feel can hold them off, but if the ships bowl their way in, they have big problems. When they decide they're going to actually defend the town, the Black Sea Fleet numbers about 60 ships. It is everything from about a dozen modern paddle wheel steamers, gunboats like Missouri was, some of iron, most of wood. But there's a lot of aging ships there too, 74s, 90s, 120 gun ships of the line. These are the beautiful ones you see in the paintings, but they're old news at this point. So the Tsar, or I guess Prince Constantine's in charge of the defense, he says, look, we're gonna sacrifice the ships, strip the guns, bring the crews ashore, and he takes about a dozen ships and sinks them in a block line here, and sinks another dozen in a block line here. The morning the French and British decide to go attack the town with their fleet, they notice the Russians all lined up in a line of battle with their sails lowered and not even firing any cannon. And then one by one the ships go down and sink and it, all they see are masts sticking up above the water. Unbeknownst to them, the currents in about four or five months will totally open the channel. But they don't know that, only the Russians do. But they can still see these masts and it works. They bombard the outer forts but they can't get through. So this trick which costs the Russians about two dozen ships actually works quite well. As the siege goes on and there's nothing for the Navy to do, only the paddle wheel steamers dash out now and then and make life hell for the French and British behind the lines, they are basically anchored. The crews are sent ashore with their artillery. They form 18 different naval brigades. 70% of them will be dead 
by the time the siege is over. This is a lot like World War I. When the Tsar realizes that by capturing one or two key forts down here, they can no longer defend the town, the entire army and navy are evacuated on the causeway to the North Shore. They don't actually leave. This is where they sit out the rest of the war firing back at the French and British who never tried to cross the causeway again. The Tsar orders every single ship in the harbor scuttled, all the merchantmen and every single warship. The paddle wheel steamers, which are the latest in high tech at that time, are going to make a dash for it, but bad weather keeps them in port, so they are sunk also. Now this is a meditated thing, this is planned. They're not just pull the plug on the ship and let it sink. The Tsar realizes salvaging technology and skill is to the point where he can get his ships back. So what he's doing is putting them on deposit somewhere where it's a major inconvenience for the enemy to take them. The wooden ships, he figures he's going to lose those. They're aging anyway, and there's more problems with those we'll talk about in a minute. But with all the iron ships and every steam engine, they're coated with a protective covering so that nothing will rot on the bottom. When the ships are scuttled, it's uh, odd to count these. Uh, the counts go anywhere from about 90 ships over 100. It was devilishly tough to get an idea of accuracy. The French use one set of numbers, the Russians another when you can find their records, the British something totally different. Uh, the number 95 is pretty close to that. They scatter not just here, they cluster here and here and all over the bay. It is literally covered with almost 100 ships on the bottom with mass sticking up now and then. When you see a picture of Sevastopol Harbor, it looks like, oh, nothing much is going on. Do you see one little lone stick here, here, there, and everywhere? The Russians actually make very, very detailed maps of the entire harbor. They don't give those to the French and British, of course, who after the war offer to come in and salvage all those ships. There's a wonderful cartoon that appeared in Punch showing a British sailor fishing with his, his creel and his rod, and he turns over his shoulder and says to his buddy, oh, Jim, bring the net. I've hooked another 74 because there are so many ships down there, you could literally walk across the bay on these ships. Now, the British offer, again, for an awful lot of money to quote-unquote clear the harbor. Their idea of clearing the harbor is stripping the ships of anything valuable, and by the way, taking it back to England, and then blasting them a little bit. They want Sevastopol to stay clogged up for years. They want the ships just to rot so you can't use the port. And it is so clogged right now that when I introduce John Gowan in a moment, he recons the, the bay, it takes him about an hour in a boat to go only a mile because he can't thread his way between the ships safely enough. And that's with guides. So they've got basically an entire Black Sea fleet and a lot of merchantmen sitting on the bottom there. Turns out there's also a lot of valuable salvage down there too. Well, the, uh, the Russian Duke Constantine, of course, he has a nice little comeback when the British offered to salvage it. He's quoted as saying, I would not hire a British engineer to pull a rusty nail from a rotten plank. Because <laughs> of course it's their fault the ships are down there. So he says to his ambassador in the US, Stokel, find me John Gowan. Now for those of you who are here for the Missouri talk, you know a little bit about John Gowan. Uh, and, and our John told you a little bit more about him. He's from Lynn, Massachusetts. He's totally self-taught. Uh, we don't know what he, he doesn't have much of an education formally. We think he went to about third grade in Lynn. He starts off with his buddy Thomas Wells in the wine business. He's an importer-exporter in the coastal trade uh, up out of Boston. And at some point, he just decides to start reading books about salvage. In 1849, he goes on his first dive, if you will. And they uh, go up off the coast of Canada and bring up treasure from a wreck, sell it in Boston, things like that, make enough money to invest in new diving suits and come out with their own diving suit, the world-famous, his words, not mine, Wells and Gowan Submarine Armor. That's the name for the dry diving dress at the time is Submarine Armor. And they sell a number of these. What's more, in probably an underhanded backdoor Yankee deal, uh, the Secretary of State taps him on the shoulder to go raise Missouri. Now John was right that Missouri went down to eight and a half years. In those eight and a half years from 43 to 1850, the British have tried every single thing they can to get the ship out of Gibraltar Bay. And they can't do it because it's an iron wheeled paddle steamer. Think of Ferris wheels, 28 feet diameter, rotting on the bottom. It's a mass of metal that is fused, the axle, the wheels, and the engines into one massive piece that weighs about 50 tons. And the British is blasting it ineffectually. Again, Gowan sits there, thinks about it a little bit, goes over with 24 di gigantic underwater bombs, if you will, torpedoes, and uses only half of them. Because Gowan knows how to attack the wheels at the hubs. Believe it or not, the British are working their way in, taking a top-down approach. Gowan also realizes that the key to getting Missouri out is by attacking her keel. Break that spine and the ship will fall apart. He pulls off what the British couldn't do in eight and a half years in about five months' time. Mm -hmm. And if you want to read some chest-thumping, fly-waving you know, rhetoric in the newspaper, it's great stuff when he comes home. Because not only are we proud of him, we're proud that he did this to the British, who of course for years have been saying, we have the most professional divers. If we can't do it, you can't do it. Gowan's opinion expressed much later in time, of course, about the British was that they are wonderful engineers. He would hire nobody else except a British engineer when it came to tackling a known project in a known way. But for doing something new, they're worthless. 
<laughs> Stokel actually finds Gowan down in the Caribbean. He's only been doing salvage, uh, it's about 1856 now. He did salvage work off the coast and on the Great Lakes for about a year. Got tired of that evidently or didn't make ends meet. And he's, believe it or not, down mining bird guano, which is a, a hyper wonderful phosphate fertilizer that uh, actually almost started several wars with us, the guano wars, believe it or not. And he finds him down in the Caribbean and basically says, you got a couple months, the Tsar would like to talk to you. So he goes, you know, to Russia and uh, prepares a, a plan. The Russians have given him some paperwork ahead of time, the maps where the ships are and things like that. And he goes to Sevastopol and he spends about a month diving on different ships, taking a look at all that. Comes back to the Tsar and Prince Constantine, who's his main contact, and says, uh, I can do this, you know, and, and here's my bid. His bid, oddly enough, is higher than the French and British ones, because a lot of companies are trying for this job. It's very lucrative. The Tsar, with that opinion of, you know, expressed by Constantine about pulling a rotten or a rusty nail of a rotten plank, says, you're my man. I want John Gowan to do it. Gowan comes home again in a, a, a very impressive logistics feat. In four months' time, he prepares the entire expedition. He doesn't go to Boston, though. He goes to Philadelphia, probably because Philadelphia has a lot more industry right there along the Delaware than we did. And Gowan has some heavy-duty stuff that he's devised. Now, to back up, there is a, an old technique of raising ships called raising by lumps. A lump is a Scandinavian word means a, a block or a brick. And it's a squarish or a harbor lighter, if you will, just a utility vessel. And the British would ring lumps, if you will, around a sunken anchor, small ship, things like that, with derricks on board. And then the idea was it would all raise at the same time, and the ship would hopefully come up. The problem is raising by lumps takes incredible timing and balance. Because if one lump pulls too much, everything goes to hell in a handbasket real fast. So raising by lumps was already sort of disused practice. Gowan figures a way to raise by lumps on a massive scale and beat the balance problem. In Philadelphia, and this is why he needs the heavy industry, he has caissons built that are 50 feet square, 13 feet high, out of solid one or two foot bulks of timber that run the entire length. It's reinforced with iron, and the entire bottom half, where he knows it's going to be sitting in the water, is kyanized, treated with a, a new, then new technique uh, of using copper to impregnate the wood so it would be eaten by worms and that. He has steam apparatus up on top here, and a 20-ton collar that goes through the bottom like this. Through that, he has chains that go down. The chains he designs are 300 pounds per link. They're the largest chains in the world at this time. They are forged, again, in Philadelphia. He has four of these things made in the space of four months from January till April of 1857. They're all dismantled and put aboard two ships, and the Yankee expedition for Sevastopol heads off. Now, Gowan, knowing the scale of this, has already sent ahead a team of 20 men to, believe it or not, start building a Yankee seaport. His men are going to be there for a number of years. He knows that Sevastopol has been flattened. They basically have to build a village on a beach. He leaves on June 3rd, arrives to Sevastopol about a month later, takes about 40 days to get there, followed by about 10 days later by the first ship with one case on. You'll hear the phrase in this presentation a lot, breakings and burstings. If a company used to fail in the last, last century, 19th century, they would say that it had burst or gone up. Well, burstings and breakings is something that Gowan will face again and again and again, and yet he will solve every one of them. The first bursting and breaking he has is that the second ship, which has three caissons, doesn't show up until the end of August. He now only has about two months before the weather starts to close in, and his men have barely finished assembling the first caisson. So that's the first glitch in the plan. They didn't stop and think through how long it was going to take when you're outside of a factory city to put four of these together. What's more, three have arrived so terribly late. The Russians are a little concerned because by the end of 1857, not a single ship has come up at all. And Gowan is, you know, supposedly the best thing since sliced bread. What has happened is that Gowan has started blasting some of the old ships of the line. Now, one reason he's willing to destroy those and the Russians don't care about it is that the rest of the world never believed this, but the Russians always knew it was true. The Black Sea, and especially Sevastopol Harbor, is infested with shipworms, Teredo Nivalis. The Russians used to complain that no ship in the Black Sea fleet lasted more than 15 years. And the rest of the world, of course, said that's because you use rotten wood, and you know, you're not good at this, and your ships are terrible. Well, Gowan actually took a piece of wood from one of the ships when he did his recon back to St. Petersburg and made sure the Russians saw what he was working with. Shipworms start their life as very, very tiny little critters called villagers. You can't even see them. And they float along in the current until they find a piece of wood. It doesn't matter what flavor it is, they just love it. And they'll bore in. That little hole will be there for the rest of the life of that piece of wood, whether it's a piling or ship's timber. And it looks totally innocent, almost like powder post beetle holes, the head of a pin. But once inside, when the villager begins feasting and becomes a trader of Alice, 
he can grow over a foot long and the channels get as big as a pencil or your little finger. And they seem to have an uncanny ability never to hit another tunnel and never to again puncture the outside of the wood. So you can look at a piece of wood like this and say, ah, that looks good and sound. You can probably kick it in half because the pictures that Gowan showed, you can look this up online, it, it's just honeycomb. You couldn't put any more of these little channels in there. The ships are rotten. So the Russians say, go ahead and blast them. We'll supply all the powder. That's the Russians' first mistake because blasting these ships where the timbers are so rotted is like putting dynamite in a bowl of pudding. <laughs> it blows the pudding to smithereens, but everything to either side is just like, you feel something? <laughs> now that he's, he's going through five, thousand pounds of powder on one ship and it's not done and the Russians are watching the dollar signs or ruble signs mount 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 because they're promising all this powder and they said you're forbidden to start a second ship till you finish one of these at least so he ends a year working on about a dozen ships or so and waiting for his guys to assemble those caissons the weather finally clears about February or March and his men immediately go down and start building caissons and just to give you an idea of the scale of this operation he brings 150 Americans with him House builders, ships joiners, ships caulkers, uh, mechanics, motormen, you name it, they're over there. Uh, boat builders, anything from a Yankee seaport. He has a, a complete machine shop, everything you can think of. He also has 150 naked divers. Before you get an image in your mind, that just means they're not in submarine armor, all right? It's cold in these waters. <laughs> and he has hired three to 5,000 Russian laborers, Chilarex, to do the grunt work. The only time they get to stop is when they know they're going to blow something up in the harbor because it's wonderful to watch the geyser of water, you know. But otherwise, there's 5,000 Russians working for this guy for a couple kopecks a day, if you will. Uh, conditions for Gowan's men are, are very, very difficult. The water's in the bay, the current is very sluggish, and what's more, in the holds of the ship where they're working, not only is it dark, it is constantly cold, and they can't see what they're doing. Their hands are constantly cut up by the muscles that have formed on every side of the ship. So in the evening, they have to dress their hands with, with suet and mutton and wrap them and hope they heal up by morning. There are a few sharks here and there that, that get a little too friendly, quote unquote, and as if that weren't bad enough, when their day of work is done, they're assaulted in their sleep by millions of fleas. One Yankee said, I think, the only thing I fear is that they realize their power and unite and drag me out of bed. This was a legacy of the thousands and thousands of soldiers that have spent a year there, for goodness sakes. So Gowan and his men finally get the caissons built. And the way the caissons are supposed to work, the thinking is sound up to a point. He's got four caissons, and they are going to be ranged two on each side of a ship. And the chains will come down through the center to the sunken ship. So that's our water surface here. All right. The idea is that they'll support the ship. Originally, Gowan says, well, let's just go through some of the gun ports and see if, if they'll support that. Chains rip right up through the center of the things. Gowan says, okay, we'll cut a hole in the orlop deck, the, the lowest one down, and we'll reinforce with an iron collar. Well, the chain just brought the iron collar up, too. So now he realizes the only way to do this is to bottom sling these things, which are sinking in the mud. So he has to have his, uh, his iron workers make two-foot square, two-inch thick iron plates. They're drags, basically. And he has his men position those beside a ship, and then from a lighter on the surface, a steam lighter, they'll drag it out. 10, 15 feet, and slowly dredge a channel to the keel. Then his men will take a 30 foot long needle, about two inches thick, and put it underneath the ship. To the eye of the needle is tied a stout rope. That rope then goes to a lighter chain and to a heavy chain, and slowly that 300 pounds per length chain is passed into the ship and tightened up. All the ships begin lifting at once. Now, the way Gallant fixed the stability problem, supposedly, is that these are floodable. So the chain is tightened, and the ships, the caissons, are flooded down to within two feet of the surface. So now your surface of water is here. When it gets that low, they make sure the chains are tightened and they pump out the caissons. Gowan calculated that between the steam engines, or the hydraulic ram on the, the surface pulling the chain and the buoyancy of those four caissons, he has 4,800 tons of lifting power. The biggest ship in the harbor is about 5,000 tons. So he figures this is gonna be a done deal. The problem is Gowan has placed anchors to hold these things in place. The anchors let go constantly. He has steamships stationed on either end here, chuffing as hard as they can to keep these in place. And still the anchors let go and the steamships are dragged back. So what happens then is, this is the situation you end up getting. He says, all I can see are masts. I can't raise the ship above the water level. He realizes that he's made a miscalculation and he's gonna have to redesign these caissons. In the course of 1858, though, however, he does manage to bring up about 15 ships, some of the lighter ships, a couple hundred tons, things like that. Now, Gowan, of course, he's, he's a self-promoter. You have to be at this point in history. Uh, there's really no PR agents or things like that. And he doesn't actually lie to the American public. He says, I've raised 15 vessels. 
let the American public think that means 120 gun, you know, line of battleships. If you look at his listing, which is in the book of, uh, that he kept very careful track of what he raised, these are things like dredges, uh, <laughs> floating dry docks, small cutters, things like that. He brought up 15 vessels, let's say, and not 15 ships of the line. So nonetheless, he designs, redesigns things. That year ends, he's got 15 ships, quote unquote, and to wind the season up, at the end of summer, he goes after an ironclad, not ironclad, I'm sorry, an iron gunboat, the Dunage or Danube, and it's a fiasco. But again, he works around it. The problem with one of these ships is that they can't get their chains in the right spot to lift it. All the weight here is in the middle of the ship. On a sailing ship, a wooden ship, the weight's pretty evenly distributed. This is the first time someone's had to deal with all the weight of a ship basically being here in the center. And because they can't get their chains because of the size of the caissons close enough, they start to bring the dunage up and she breaks the surface. The stern breaks there and the bow breaks there. They've snapped the ship in half. And Gowan is like, okay, don't anybody write home about this. We're gonna figure out what to do. What he does, I actually learned a, a new use for an old term. He basically cuts the ship in half and he puddles or makes a dam, if you will, on either end of the ship. So now he has two ship halves and he can raise those independently. And he says, it floats like a duck. They drag it off and they start to just dismantle it at the dockside. So he winds up the season with a bit of a success after a big failure and only bringing up small ships. But he has brought up a number of ships in this year. Over the course of that winter, when his men can't actually do anything, they are feverishly trying to plan what to do about the caissons that are not working. He realizes that bringing them up from the center was a sound idea as far as solving the lump problem and getting balance, but he can't do anything about, he can't just put more anchors down there. It just rips out of the bottom all the time. He redesigns caissons. This takes all of 1858. And the reason it takes so long is he's not in Philadelphia anymore. Sevastopol is a desert. There is nothing there. His industry of salvaging ships is the third thing you can do in Sevastopol beyond the artillery shells and the you know, dead horses. Uh, he has to contract with a, a firm in England, oddly enough, to make even bigger chains that are massive. They're about double the weight, double the size, with very little play between the links. And the British try and talk him out of this. He goes, no, I know what I'm doing. Do what I say. Because the other chains also keep snapping all the time because of the weight of the ships. He makes giant chains. He also redesigns his old caissons and has two new ones built. And the problem is, I said Sevastopol's a desert. He has to have the Russians fell trees in Poland that are long enough and thick enough to be sent down the rivers and then hand sawed in pits in Sevastopol. There is no sawmill in Russia at this point in time that can handle something like that. He's also supersized things. The new caissons are 100 feet as opposed to 50 and they're 22 feet high. These ones are also compartmentalized. You can flood each chamber separately. The chain also goes over the end this way. Now, originally or initially you would think, okay, that's just gonna cause a balance problem. As soon as he takes a drag on this, this thing's gonna do that. This is where Gowan's genius comes in. By flooding this stern chamber, he balances the pull on this chain. So he can sink the entire case on as far as he wants to. Again, within a couple feet of the water, if it's a light ship, it'll just raise it. A heavier ship, he has to just balance it so that it stays level. And if he wants to, at the very end, when it's almost all the way out of the water, say it needs a couple extra feet, he can pump these dry, pump more water in the stern, and it'll actually lift the ship even further. Once the ship is on the surface, they can clear the mud off, pump it out, take it away. And by the way, this is the only approach that's going to work with all those worm-ridden ships. A number of his competitors uh, tried to get him to use something newer, making fun of him for using raising by lumps because it was outdated and things like that. But the problem was when one or two of his competitors tried these things, they realized they weren't going to work. For instance, you can't pump these ships out by just plugging up the portholes while they sit on the bottom. Because the wormholes are so bad, it basically is like sucking water in as fast as the pump is dragging it out through thousands of little straws. They said, well, okay, we'll put airbags. Remember the Missouri talk? That one is death on airbags because all they do is go pop, pop, pop. They never work. But someone said, okay, put them inside the ships. We'll inflate them. Well, as soon as the pressure hit those wooden walls, pop. They popped. The ships popped. It didn't work at all. This is really the only approach that seems like it's going to work. Gowan, we believe, I believe, finished his two new caissons at the very tail end of 58 because he managed to raise one single ship, the Krim or Crimea. Krim is important because she's blocking access to three other iron paddle wheel steamers, the Bessarabia, the Gromada Sets, and the Odessa. And that's important because Gowan has until the 1st of November to get them out of the water. And none of them are out of the water at that point in time. And the Russians are charging him 
500 rubles per week per ship. That's 9,500 bucks in modern money every single week those ships aren't raised. So with winter closing in, he rushes and raises the crim. It's very innocently listed at the end of the year in the newspapers and that, and it's like, okay, what's different about this ship? Why'd they work well in the December in freezing cold weather to get the crim out of the way? Well, for one, it stops the meter running on at least one ship. And then in February of 59, when it's still freezing out there, up pop the other three ships in rapid succession. So he's not losing money on that anymore. The money he's losing, of course, is dwarfed by the money they're making. Even before the th three caissons that he's missing in 57 show up, Gowan had said, I could make $3,000 a day for 300 days just bringing up salvage. The, th the materials on the ships, the fittings are so valuable, though the British and French didn't take, it's just there for the, the salvaging. Also, the Russians, for instance, uh, sank one ship, the Barazon, full of copper plating for the bottom of hulls, and they knew right where it was. He raises that and makes a couple million right off the bat. They dumped about 40 different brass howitzers over the side of that causeway when they escaped. Those are worth about 10,000 a piece in modern money. So they're racking up money like crazy. The whole expedition supposedly cost only about two and a half million dollars. His investors have made this over 10, 12, 20 times. So there's nobody back in Philadelphia complaining, but Gowan is worried about getting ships up. Uh, in the spring in February, March and April, he brings up the three ships, and this clears the way to start raising the larger ships throughout 1859. Gowan finally has both caissons ready. The crim comes up. He uses them on all the other ships. And as you start to edge into 1860, he's already brought up 15 fairly heavy ships, and there are two left in the harbor. These are the signature characteristic ships that the world has identified as Sevastopol. One is the Kulevchi. Kulevchi is a large frigate, uh, multi-deck, and she's about 4,500 tons. She sits in the middle of the harbor, and the reason she's iconic is it's her mass you can see. No matter what else Gowan clears, there she sits in the middle of the bay, waiting for somebody to get her up. He manages to raise her up and drag her off, no problem. And now he's going after the most famous ship in the harbor, the most infamous. This is the Vladimir. Vladimir is an iron paddle wheel steamer. And she's one of those ones that gave nightmares to the French and British because she had a knack of sneaking up in the middle of the night to some unseen bay. What you can't tell from a map unless you zoom in is the entire edge of the, the shoreline in Sevastopol Bay is just covered with little inlets like fingers that stick up. And it was nothing unusual for the French and British troops to wake up in the morning, take a peek. It's like, oh my God, there's the Vladimir. And she would lob some mortar shells, get up steam and go away. A couple times she also broke through their supposed blockade and shelled positions and went out raiding and capturing other ships before the British and French could get steam up or get underway. So they, they, don't, they want the Vladimir to like rot in place. Doesn't matter it was English built. They just don't want the Vladimir to come up. The Russians want the Vladimir back in a big way. They would like to get all their fleet back, but the Vladimir especially. Oddly enough, Gowan doesn't write much about Vladimir. He manages to bring her up in the spring of 1860 and the world assumes at that point that this is a done deal. There's the Kalevchi, there's the Vladimir, you know, Huzzah. And actually the uh, English medalist, Taylor, strikes a medal that shows the Kulevchi, I suppose, although it's as big as a 120-gun ship. He obviously didn't visit, with Gowan's caissons, spewing water, raising her in the middle of the harbor, and there's the military barracks in the background and everything. And he puts on there, quite hopefully, 1857, 8, 9, and 60. Done deal. And I actually have uh, seen a picture of that. Gowan had it made into a lapel pin that uh, he kept for the rest of his life and passed on to his kids. His great-grandson showed her to me. However, Gowan knows the job's not quite done. There are still a number of ships down there. He's got probably about 15 ships left on the bottom, some of them major ships, major warships. He expects to raise them because one of his men writes home that things are moving so slowly. We spent four months trying to get chains under one of these ships. The problem is now, it's been a number of years since the battle. And like Missouri and, and uh, at Gibraltar, the currents have slowly rocked the ships and settled them into the bottom. And the mud is like glue. The mud at first was seen as a good thing because where the mud covered the ships, the worms couldn't get to them. Well now they're so deep, that's why it took four months to dredge channels and thread chains under these last few ships. And then when he tries to raise them, he finds out that in clearing them, it's open season for the worms. The worms have come in and devoured them even more. So when he tries to raise these ships, even the big chains and all the caissons just cut right up through them. He has no choice but to blast. So for most of 1860, after the Kulevchi and the, Dan the new um, Vladimir come up, he just blasts and blasts and blasts. But again, he has the same putting in dynamite problem. The ships are reluctant, they, they're resistant to this. They don't want to be blown apart. Finally, as it comes into spring of 1861, Gallen realizes I have a deadline coming. He is supposed to have the harbor cleared by contract by 1st of April, 1862. <coughs> Spring comes and Gowan has only seven merchantmen left. Three are stuck up way at the eastern end where nobody goes anyway. They were just taken in and scuttled. Four are in a tiny little appendage to the bay called Careening Bay where they would take ships to tip over and clean their bottoms. They're not a hazard of navigation whatsoever. 
knowing the deadline is coming, the port officials forbid him to work on these ships until April 2nd. <laughs> Gowan, of course, complains to the Tsar because he just, by the terms of the contract, forfeited all his equipment and was not going to get paid one ruble. Gowan goes and complains in that, and there's a lot of back and forth wheeling and dealing. He uh, approaches the Tsar, he talks to Duke Constantine, he tries to get the Navy to understand, and they basically all stonewall him. Uh, finally, they pay him for a couple of the ships he raised years ago, and then tell the Tsar, he's been paid, don't worry about it. And when Gowan approaches the Tsar, the Tsar says, this man I've known my whole life, my minister so-and-so, has assured me that you were paid. Who am I to believe, you a foreigner or this man? No one ever gave the Tsar any numbers. He's not supposed to deal with business stuff. The bottom line of the entire multi-year salvage operation is, he is never paid by the Russians for raising the entire Black Sea Fleet. He had brought up 22 ships intact, uh, blown apart and salvaged and removed 39 others, and left about 16 on the bottom to rot. So by ship count, it is the largest salvage operation in the history of the world. Now, Gowan is not paid, and this went into the courts until 1875. It actually became a matter of state. Uh, Secretary of State Fish got involved at one point. But as Gowan is getting older, doing other things, the Russians are dying or not caring anymore, it, they never really get any money to him at all. His great-grandson, when, when he read the book, actually said, I wonder if there's a suit there for us somewhere with, <laughs> with Putin if he would pay up at this point in time. The question then, of course, is how high did this go? Who, who cheated whom? Is it the local military governor, Admiral Grigory Budakov? Is it Duke Constantine, or is it the Tsar himself? The answer is all the above. What the world doesn't know is, the Crimean War cost the Russians not just in lives, it cost them a lot of money. They're refurbishing as fast as they can because they expect to go to war not only in Europe, they expect to come into our civil war on the side of the North against the French and the British and, and the Southerners. And this almost happened a couple times, but that's a whole other topic. Uh, they basically don't have two rules to rub together. And from the get-go, the instructions, which again, there's no copy of them survives, tacitly or, or whatever, were to, to make sure that you didn't spend any more money than you had to. This is why the Russians begin to freak when they realize that they're going through money like crazy on gunpowder in the beginning. Uh, at one point, the Russians offered to build Gowan a small steam lighter, if you will, a little 30-foot thing. And they quote him an enormous price, like $20,000. And Gowan's like, no, 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 no problem, don't worry about it. He goes away and builds it for about $1,000. Has his own Yankee shipwrights build it right there in the little seaport. And when the Russian officers see it, they're like, what's that? Well, that's the ship we wanted built. Oh, what did it cost you? Thousand. Oh, oh, okay, okay. They were gonna line their own pockets with it too. Mm -hmm. At one point when he sells a ship, he's not paid for it, and he goes and complains to Constantine, and Constantine orders the Navy to pay for it, which they refuse to do, until, again, it goes to the Tsar, he's paid for the ship. But then the next few ships he sells to the Russians, they deduct the money that he got for the first ship, and it goes into the pockets of the Russians. <laughs> the, uh, the, the government is in such bad shape that whenever they really feared war in the mid-1860s, someone had said, if it comes to war, the government will be embarrassed in even maintaining its normal operations. There just was no money. Because while the Russians are also not investing in Sevastopol, this is something that really disturbed the people that hung around uh, and the Navy. That had been their, their queen of bases, if you will. But it is destroyed. Even those beautiful Karabonaya docks, the British made sure to destroy those. They sent ships in and sunk them and blew things apart, and they're, they're trashed. Everyone expected them to refurbish Sevastopol. They don't. They actually invest in Odessa and Nikolaev up on the, uh, the rivers to the north, and those become their major naval bases for the next couple of decades, if you will. So they just write off Sevastopol. Oddly enough, of all the ships that Gowan raised, the Russians end up writing most of them off too. So one wonders if you're going to write the bay off anyway, and the port, why bother to clear it? The British plan would have worked just well, let them rot. But they wanted probably just to thumb their nose at the English and raise the ships. So Gowan is never paid, but just as, just as this story began with an ending, it sort of ends with a beginning. One of the things that John Gowan does when he's over there on his free time, because his men always got Sundays off, and when he wasn't actually diving, he was free to go explore. The siege had been so horrific that while the Russians had one graveyard on the North Shore that grew enormously over time, the British and French had basically had regimental cemeteries. 168 cemeteries ring the entire southern side of Sevastopol, and most people don't know where they are. Well, what Gowan does is he goes out and acquaints himself with where they're all at. Because as English and French tourists, I don't mean to make light of that, they're mostly family members trying to find out where their son was killed and you know, where his grave is. They know to go to John Gowan. He'll play local tour guide. And he and his wife actually adopt one or two individual graves, uh, his wife especially, to refurbish and try and get things to grow. He experiments with hundreds of different kinds of trees to find out what's going to survive in that harsh climate. Uh, and, and beyond that, Gowan also goes to some of the more major cemeteries where the walls have been knocked down by wandering cattle or people have vandalized stuff. And on his own dime, he refurbishes those. 
Now this not only impresses the Russians, even though they're fallen enemies, it impresses the French and British and the Turks and the rest of the world. People who weren't even part of the war are impressed. And while the Russians cheat him out of every ruble he was owed, Gowan leaves Sevastopol with more of those gaudy, bejeweled 19th century medals and crowns, silver snuff boxes, diamonds galore from queens and kings and dukes everywhere. He's a household word at this point for his humanitarian efforts. And because he managed to pull off the engineering feat, he's also acknowledged now as a world famous engineer. Now, one thing I didn't mention at the beginning was he's also called Colonel John Gowan now, who somehow <coughs> seems to have been in the U.S. Army. This was partly intentional. Remember that Sevastopol was a military base in 1857. So when you go there, you have to have some sort of rank to impress the locals. Gowan has never been in the military, but Pennsylvania and Philadelphia are so behind this expedition, they make him an honest to God colonel in the Pennsylvania State Militia. <laughs> and I do wish I had this picture because I found a picture of the full regalia. It's got the bicorn hat with more ostrich feathers than any one bird ever wore. Uh, kid gloves up to here. Epaulets, you know, that just go and, and braids everywhere. And it's just a gorgeous thing. And a number of his next in rank became lower ranking officers, all dandies. And of course one cynical newspaper said, this is sure to impress the braves of Sevastopol, who of course have just survived the siege and lost the war. But it's important because the Russian Navy, which runs the place, will not respect them. Even men who were in the Navy petitioned the Secretary of the Navy at that time to wear what was called a Navy pin. It was basically a badge you got, but you had to have permission to wear it. And going to this foreign country, they all got permission. Because as soon as the Russians knew, okay, you really were in the Navy, don't really care too much what your rank was, but if you did this, I'll talk to you. And from the flip side, we have a letter from another fellow, another Yankee who went over there, and his sister said in the newspaper when she posted his letter, John left the party early because you know how he hates to be second to anybody, but the Russians wouldn't talk to him because he had never been in the military and never in the Navy. So he becomes, when he, is a, he is a colonel, legitimately in the Pennsylvania militia. And then at the end of his signature sometimes, he would put U.S. so people would know where he's from. Well, after the war, when the Brits are more familiar with the way things work over here, they assumed that U.S. was short for USA, must be U.S. Army. So all of a sudden, he became a military colonel of engineers in the Army. And you still find references to him as an engineer in the Civil War, which he wasn't. He stayed over there after 1862 and uh, did a little investing in oil fields and that, ran a couple lines of freighters for the Russians, put in some rail lines, things like that. And we have, I have wonder if that's how the Russians think he was getting paid, if he could make money from oil in that. Gowan comes back here periodically to Lynn, Massachusetts and did a couple projects here and there. Uh, his entire career, and I won't go into detail here because uh, the entire life, like 40 pages of the book, each chapter could be a new book for goodness sakes. The guy is interesting. The thing I found very rewarding about John Gowan is, let me back up. Uh, you've heard the name Daniel Borston, America's most famous historian. Borston said that the best ideas, the most promising things, the most rewarding undertakings occur on what he calls the fertile verges where two totally different things meet, whether it's city and country, high and low, doesn't matter. Well, Gowan works on one of those fertile verges, and where Gowan works is between old ideas and new ideas. Remember the airbags that everyone said, these are the greatest things in sliced bread, let's use them? How often today do people run after technology just because it's new? Think of the lines outside an iPhone store or an Apple store when something new is coming out. It doesn't matter if it works better or not, it's new, I gotta have it. The world wanted airbags even though popping was the only noise they made. <laughs> Gowan, on the other hand, would look at an old idea. And whereas today we use the word innovate to make something new, back in the day when he was using the word innovate, we would sometimes use the word renovate. It meant to make something new again, not just make something new, period. So his whole idea, well, the, the anchor thing finally you know, flummoxed him up there with the first caissons. The whole idea of supersizing something like that and solving the balance problem and raising by lumps was sheer genius. And then having multi-compartmented caissons to solve the problem of raising those ships without dragging yourself down. Again, stroke of genius. Everything he does for the rest of his life is in that same vein. Unfortunately, the world is so interested in you know, flashing new things then, just as they are now, that a lot of times his ideas aren't taken up. Uh, one of his most promising was to actually rig the entire levee system along the Mississippi with telegraph lines that would send a constant current. That way, if the levee was broken by a flood and the line went down, they identified where the break was like that and go repair it. It wasn't a bad idea. He had a number of plans for raising ships up over bars at the mouths of rivers to get them in. And it was, it was a heavy investment at first, but it meant you'd have to dredge the channel every couple of years. We ended up dredging all the time. Another time an English, major English warship went down off Ireland in the 1870s. And Gowan said, look, let's build caissons. It'll take us a little while, but I guarantee we'll get it up. The British said, no, no, we have the most professional divers. Same old song. The ship is still on the bottom off Ireland. <laughs> That is pretty much all I'm going to talk about John Gowan. Two books is enough, okay? 
<laughs> I'm back to Civil War after this for the next talk, secret weapons and all that. <laughs> Can I answer any questions for you about John Gowan or the operation? <laughs> Thank you. Yep. I have one quick question. At the beginning, he was getting all this material for salvage, which was quite good. Didn't, and didn't that continue as they... They it, it tapers off because, of course, when they have nothing else to do, remember for the first year they can't do anything until the other case ones get there, and then they can't do anything major. He, I don't know if he's getting a paycheck. I assume he was an investor in this company because it, it had some high rollers back in Philadelphia underwriting this thing, and I'm sure a lot of the profits went home. I mean, they actually sent their corporate treasurer with him to Sevastopol to keep tabs on things. Not that he was cheating, just to make sure everything made it back. Uh, and they, they constantly, the newspapers, four or five times in the first couple of years, talk about the, the tens of thousands of pounds worth of iron that they've taken back to England to sell as salvage. So I, I assume he makes money there. Uh, whenever he has to sell or forfeit all his equipment, though, the reports I had make it sound like that stuff belonged to him. I think he had been promised that by the Russians. It was 355,000 rubles, which translated to $6.75 million if he sold the gear. Whether part of that was supposed to go to the stockholders, I never found evidence for or against that. But he came out of there pretty much a broke man. But because of the fame he had gotten, he gets a lot of lucrative jobs after that. And of course, he can always hawk a bauble if he wants to and you know, sell a medal. <laughs> <laughs> Did he have any role in our Civil War? No, he actually didn't. He was under contract till 1862, uh, came back briefly to Lynn, and then went back overseas after dropping off a lot of souvenirs, which no longer exist. Lynn got a couple of cannons and things like that, but he went back over to undertake other contractual salvage operations overseas. He just never took part in the war. Oddly enough, to give you an idea of how things get lost to history, in an 1830, 1930 book that was cataloging artifacts on display at the Boston Club, something which isn't there anymore, it lists two Russian naval cutlasses brought back by Colonel Gowan. So I went tracking whatever happened to this. Oh, well, they're at the Peabody Essex Museum. Oh, okay. Well, for one, Peabody Essex doesn't put any emails online. It took me about a year to find somebody I could contact. Mm -hmm. And what it finally turns out is I described these things that we have no record of these, da 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 And I talked to another person a year later, and this person dredged up photographs that purported to be Russian, or I mean, uh, Confederate artillery swords. They're not. They're John Gowan's cutlasses. <laughs> because if you look closely, what they are, they aren't actually Russian Navy cutlasses. They're French uh, infantry swords, which they're all issued, which of course we patterned our swords after the cutlasses in the Civil War. So there's a great similarity. But when you zoom in, you can see the wire wrapping. It's quite obviously an 1830s French sword that's been misidentified. Someone at some point transcribed a number, cataloged it wrong, didn't know what it was, and a later museum curator said, oh, that looks like an artillery sword from you know, the Mississippi. And Gowan's swords get lost. The cannon probably got melted down somewhere you know, in an iron drive in World War II. Um, he brought back a, a beautiful two-headed Russian eagle uh, from the bowsprit of a ship, the figurehead. And the last time anyone saw any part of that, they said that they had, someone had Americanized it by lopping off one head. <laughs> <laughs> so that probably got burned, you know. <laughs> Even his family knows very little about him. Uh, I had occasion within the past year to actually meet and have dinner, uh, my wife and I, with uh, Jack C. Gowan. Uh, the Gowans, some of you may recognize, his son Constantine, who was born in Russia, comes back and becomes a concrete magnate out in Ohio. His son, I forget what he does, but he does quite well. He's the millionaire, millionaire, bleh, millionaire playboy that skippers his ship, the Speejacks, around the globe in the 1930s. His son, nickname, is Jaxie, based on Speejacks. It's really Alexander Gowan, but Jaxie's what he goes by. So we had, we had dinner, and uh, it was disconcerting because he's a spitting image of his great-grandfather. Yeah. It was like talking to the guy, which is, which is scary. So. <laughs> if you read the book, by the way, don't look for a picture of Gowan up front, because the only picture I have is a drawing based on a photo from when he's well advanced in middle age, he's got a little weight on, he's very comfortable, he looks like a banker, <laughs> and yet the guy is very, very dynamic. There are episodes in the book where he just does basically heroic things, and in sharp contrast to most of our perceptions of 19th century people uh, at his level, he just seems to be a really nice guy and you know, very innovative. Did he speak Russian? No, he did not speak Russian. Uh, actually, nobody who went on the expedition that we know of speaks Russian. Because the, the reason I say that, uh, there was one letter that a fellow wrote back saying to his friend, will you go down to so-and-so's bookshop on the corner of such and such a street, buy me whatever Russian dictionaries you could find <laughs> so I can learn to talk to people. And another time it said that a couple of the young ladies, because remember, they took their families over. This is a multi-year thing. So they're, one thing that's under the surface is they're schooling their kids. They, you know, they're running a daily life amidst all that shrapnel. You know, I'm sure you cleared the yard and said, Johnny and Janie, do not go beyond that line. But uh, they said that a couple of the ladies were trying to learn Russian. 
Another person commented that it was almost impossible to get orders because, of course, this attracted a lot of contractors. Those 150 naked divers, they were mostly Greek sponge divers who could hold their breath for a lot longer. But they had guys from all over the Levant and the Mediterranean. So you could have six different languages on board this ship. I'm sure a lot of things were like, <laughs> hold your breath. Because <laughs> no one could understand anybody else, but somehow they got the job done. <laughs> <laughs> you keep talking about Philadelphia. We're talking about the shipyard. We're talking about uh, shipbuilding companies. And what are we all along about? Philadelphia from the foundries? A lot of them aren't there anymore. But uh, uh, again, the, the book lists all the different places he had stuff made. For one, you've got all the timber in the hinterlands behind Philadelphia. You've got iron foundries on a scale that can make 20 ton collars for the centers of those that can hew and form all those 50 foot long beams and stock them on board the ships. So, and that's where he mostly drew his 150 mechanics from. Some Bostonians came with him, but most of the guys came from Philadelphia and New York. Oddly enough, and I won't go into detail here, it's in the book, his competitor who tries to sneak in ahead of him and lie to the Russians and say, oh, I'm here to, you know, salvage the ships and the Russians see through that. He's from Boston. So in effect, he's working against Bostonians while staging out of Philadelphia. But uh, those are the people that brought along the airbags and the pumps and all that and saying this, you know, your chains aren't going to work and the Gallen proved them wrong. So. Yes, sir? Uh, the uh, float design that he had with his compartment was further used in 1920 uh, down here in Black Island. Okay, is so these case ones then? They used it there. Okay. They used it on the square list. And I think they used the same things in Pearl Harbor. It, it just makes a lot of sense. Yes, but the only difference was when they went underneath the ships that were sunk in Pearl Harbor, the part of the divers used an air lance, and they would crawl underneath. And Just blasting a hole? Yeah. Okay. And then halfway through, the mud would collapse on them. Yeah. So three or four hours later, they'd get dug out. <laughs> Hanging on to the air hose for dear life. If you want to read another salvage book, probably the greatest one in history by tonnage, this is why I specify by ship count, read Cox's Navy. Cox was, again, like Gowan, a totally untrained, he's a, he's a salvage dealer. In 1919, the German high seas fleet is imprisoned at Scapa Flow. They're prisoners because, the, remember, it's a treaty, it's not an armistice, it's not an end of the war thing. They've been prisoners for a year. Somehow they coordinate, despite being under British guard, scuttling all their ships at once. And the, the British tried to shoot a couple of them and stop them, but cripes, the whole fleet goes down. And they let out the contract, who can raise these ships? And Cox gets the deal. Now, these are much bigger ships, obviously, than what were raised in Sevastopol Bay. But he adopts a similar approach. And believe it or not, he has his men go down and, again, plug up the holes, uh, strip off what they can, get chains underneath. It was the same kind of work Gowan did. In this case, though, Cox rigged floating platforms that were not meant to submerge on either side of the ship. And then along the side close to the ship, he had 20 men at giant levers with heavy chains. And like on the count of three, everybody would pull. And it was so stressful on their biceps, each man could do only 20 pulls per day before he had to go back and rest for a whole day. He manages to raise the ships that way. And the way he did it is the same way Gowan did it. You raise it as far as you can, then you push it towards shore like grounds, and then Cox would release the tension, Gowan would let the water out, and everything would raise up again. You basically hump the ship to shore like this. It's the same technique, only Cox evidently never heard of John Gowan because it would have saved his men an awful lot of pain in their arms. I imagine they retired being able to literally drag their knuckles on the ground. Was he an American? No, he was British, just a British scrap dealer. Yeah, and he, he made a profit on that because of all the metal in those ships, whereas Gowan didn't. When the Suez Canal was cleared of some ships, mm -hmm. a guy named Tom Lyons, an American from Annapolis, and a captain, was in charge of the whole operation. And uh, he had Germans working for him, he had some Americans. And uh, there was a company in New York, Merrick Chapman and Scott, mm -hmm. and salvage company. And some people from, one of them was from Rhode Island, bought the company. And, or at least his wife came from Pawtucket. So I got to know them. It's, and, it's uh, fascinating work. You know, they, it, uh, they did quite a job there. And unfortunately, you know, my, my wife is my editor. And uh, she was saying, you know, well, is, is there no monument to Gowan somewhere? And I said, there's not. Lynn actually forgot totally about him. Uh, Jackson and I right now are trying to get Lynn to at least put up a plaque somewhere. We know where he lived. Um, but I said, he didn't build things. He cleared things away. You don't, you know, an empty, an empty bay is not your monument. I mean, it, it is, but no one knows about it, you know. But uh, in, in effect, he, he's a salvage operator. There's no, he doesn't build, he can't point to a bridge. He's actually buried in Paris. He lived uh, until 1795. He never came back to the U.S. 
the, one of the few times he came back was he agreed to sell his family home in Lynn, which was not far off the common. And if you're ever up there, right now it's a paved lot because the only reason Gowan decided to sell his home was he did not want to stand in the way of progress. He's not a Luddite. He likes progress and it makes sense. A couple things he invested in there in the book you'll read really were far ahead, far thinking. But General Electric, or what would become General Electric, wanted to put up one of the first electric power plants right there off the common in Lynn. And Gowan said, I won't stand in the way. I'll sell my house. And now it's just a paved lot because the GE plant pulled out years ago. But there's a fire station next door that has a great wall that needs a plaque on it. Something, for God's <laughs> sakes. <laughs> But uh, it's interesting, they, they focus on you know, the fact that, that GE developed a rocket engine in Lynn and they want to talk about the mills and the girls and all that and you give them this favorite son and they're like, no, nah, not interested. <laughs> it's been very, very frustrating because to me it's something new and different. Oh my God, towns would kill to have someone like this in their history books. But no, they like their museum the way it is, so okay. Bit of an uphill battle. Any other questions, folks? How sophisticated was the diving equipment? It was safe if you were careful. <laughs> picture, picture the divers in the bottom of your fish tank, okay? The big helmet and all that, and the, the supposedly waterproof but constantly leaky suit of rubber impregnated canvas, heavy diving shoes. That comes out about 1828, just as we discussed with Missouri, for those of you here for that. It's reasonably safe by this point in time. Again, like with all modern divers, and you mentioned in the guys in, in Cox's Navy also, you gotta be devilishly careful that nothing gets snagged, because if the air hose gets snagged or cut, you're, you're in trouble. That is actually the only death they had at Sevastopol in all those years. A, a cutter came along and accidentally snagged one guy's line and dragged him to where his airline snapped, and they couldn't even find the guy in time to bring him up. Otherwise, it's remarkable no one was killed with all this going on. But they're, the number of deaths aren't all that high. The thing that really damns these guys is they don't understand about the bends. Bend, yeah. yeah, and they're not going that deep, which is good. Sevastopol's only 60 feet deep, so you can stay down there quite a while without worrying about it. But they're pushing 100, 150 feet occasionally. And one of the more famous divers, a naked diver, who later discovered submarine armor, John Green, John B. Green, would do naked dives, going down almost 200 feet. Basically, you know, okay, I think that's where the wreck is at. And he would go down in utter darkness, which is scary, because there's always stanchions and masts like this, you know. But he would have memorized the layout of the ship and where people thought the chest of gold was. And he'd feel his way with his few moments of air and shoot back up and say to the support crew, we've got to go this way a couple feet and we'll do it again. He would do that again and again during the day and not realizing what's happening. And he basically died in pretzel form in a hotel because that sort of thing can build up over time and cramp and then let go. Uh, by the time this happens, uh, Sevastopol happens, you coming into a second generation of divers. So when they would complain about, oh, I've had the cramps in my arm since you know, that last dive or something, I stayed down a long time, <coughs> what do you think's happening? The old guys would mock them and say, you younglings are such sissies. Just drink a gallon of honey, that always works. It's like, you know it doesn't. <laughs> but the suits, again, if you're a professional and you're careful and conditions allow, it's reasonably safe. You know, horrid accidents did happen, but it's the same in any industry, I guess. <laughs> We had a customer ran a tanker up on the Nantucket Shoals. Mm -hmm. So Captain Goodwin from Moran Towing and the uh, Merritt Chapman people went out independently. Mm -hmm. And they both came up with the same decision how to do it. So they were going to put a tug alongside Portland's Harbor to wash the sand out. Okay. Now they had a three day window. Then they were going to have another tug and they would take dynamite. If they couldn't move it that way, they were going to dynamite the midship house off the ship, and the tug would be pulling on it. They'd take everything off with dynamite. And the Coast Guard said, well, what would you do if the, uh, that didn't float the ship? And they each said, we'd start pumping cargo overboard. And the Coast Guard almost died. <laughs> <laughs> they argued, finally, nobody did anything. The ship broke in half, and all the cargo went to England. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> all right, well, thank you all very much. And by the way, bye.